Okay, so my name's Neil Young. I guess um, I'm here partly because of my experience of doing um, queer youth work for a long time, sort of doing hundreds and hundreds of hours of kind of one-to-one -one support with young people, and now I'm training as an integrative art psychotherapist. So um, that's kind of why I'm here. I'm also delivering some training around young people with Chris, who... Is Chris here? Yeah. The wonderful, amazing Chris in the front row. Um, I'm not going to say any more because I just want to maybe make you laugh and entertain you for about 40 seconds. Do you guys have wives besides being gay? No. We're a married couple, essentially. Well, when our dad married our mom, he was completely homosexual in his orientation. Only he was in such denial about it because of the social pressure. It was like he didn't even know he was gay. That happens. Well, it wasn't until he became a success in his chosen field that his ego felt, you know, strong enough to face the truth. Do you ever have sex with chicks? I don't. So, you do? I've had sex with a, a few women. Have you had sex with our dad? You are kind of his type. Do you guys have orgies? Okay, that's enough. No more talking until we get to the salon. They have orgies. Uh, apart from I really love, I absolutely love that clip. But I think just really wanting to kind of bring to our attention just uh, the impact of therapy, I guess, uh, but also something about how much children and young people see whether they tell us or not. So just as a kind of start point, really. Um, OK, so I guess I should tell you what I'm going to do, so you know. Um, I guess really what I'm looking at is some of this has been touched on already, but um, a little bit tongue-in-cheek of me, really look, starting to look at the YouGov research in a little bit more detail. And then... Um, looking at how the impact of kind of celebrities, which sometimes can be seen as very trivial, but kind of their role in potentially magnifying social change. Um, something about what's going on, what is it like being young and queer, or LGBTQI, in, right now, and of course this changes um, so quickly, and sort of delving into the youth chances research by the Metro Centre, which is so good, I mean Stonewall are using it instead of their own at the moment, it's, you know, it's the biggest study of its kind to date. <laughs> Um, and then really wanting to take it into what are the strategies that young people are using to kind of duck and dive and to survive, really, because I think these are the important things for us to know because when they turn up in our therapy spaces or for support <coughs> in other youth spaces, they're going to project these things onto us. Um, and then just sort of drawing out some kind of initial thoughts around kind of what, what does this mean for us as therapists and in our work. Um, and then a little ad for Chris and me at the end. OK, so there's been quite a lot of mention already about the YouGov research. I'm not really here to repeat a lot of that, but essentially to say, essentially, what we can see is, amongst younger people, um, there's, of course, the kind of standard where we've reached a kind of polarity around kind of people who identify as completely gay and lesbian and completely straight, um, and that we actually have an increasing number of people who are identifying as bisexual or in a, a non-binary way on the Kinsey scale. And I think this is quite an exciting... Um, and it's a fairly, fairly new and emergent trend, which has been talked about in other ways. Um, clearly, there's still the kind of context that uh, a large majority of the British public overall define as totally heterosexual or as gay and lesbian, but that increasingly we're seeing in the younger generations that that's changing. So within the research, um, they talked something about kind of openness to active bisexuality, which is a curious term, but really it just means those people who are on one rather than zero um, saying that more than a third of those people um, saying that, that they could be attracted to have sex or have a relationship <coughs> with someone of the same sex, you know, allowing for the, that right person coming along. So a kind of openness that's not a closedness um, about whether they're acting upon those feelings and, 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 yeah, those feelings, really. And that also there's increasing and quite high levels of same-sex experience, actually. So... Um, what I think is quite interesting is the numbers for 18 to 24 year olds are already nearly a quarter um, and those people, who, even the generation before, who I guess benefited from a lot of the kind of activist work and social change, legal change, that they've almost caught up with those that are up to um, 21 years older than them. So I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, and there are some differences, so I guess, um, but fairly straightforward reasons, I guess, that the numbers are higher for those um, of a higher social class or living in London or the South when compared to the North or Scotland in general terms. Um, so here's my celebrity bit. Uh, uh, really, I, just because I feel that around some, some of the young people themselves or who, you know, fairly young themselves, are really kind of attaching themselves and within and starting to, 
to kind of provide a language that isn't necessarily in the media straightforwardly. So I guess the three I have here, you know, like Miley Cyrus saying, I don't relate to being boy or girl, and I don't have to have my partner relate to boy or girl. Um, Angel Hayes, who is of, has some um, Native American heritage, quoting Andrew Gibson's poem around, no, I'm not gay, no, I'm not straight, and I'm sure as hell not bisexual, damn it. I am whoever I am when I am it. Uh, and then, you know, from within very pop culture, really, kind of Ollie Alexander with his recent release of a um, uh, single called Desire, talking about, he released a kind of blog to go with it, saying, two women, two men, a group of genderqueer people, it can all be a positive and a joyful expression of sexiness and sexuality. So uh, there's something in here that's not straightforward, superficial pop that I really kind of want to applaud, really, and, and that is in young people's lives and in terms of where they're finding inspiration and reflecting what's going on in their lives. Um, OK, so some words. <laughs> I guess I wanted to say there are some things that are happening that just aren't about what young people are working out for themselves, but where the kind of structures, often by generations before them, um, where, say, for example, you know, I would say the current government's kind of neoliberal approach around cutting services at a point which leads to increase demand for them is having a particular impact on queer young people, um, particularly across all young people, actually, around removing state support. Um, and what we're seeing, particularly in London, but across metropolitan areas and across the whole of the country, really, is that people can't afford to have their own house. That if you're younger, you're more likely to be in insecure and poorly paid work, that it's harder to go to college and to go to university. You come out with huge debts, and that benefits are being cut, and you end up living with your parents, whether you love them or not. So that kind of, I guess for me around the sort of third point really is that often LGBTQ people have experienced a kind of delay or a loss of adolescence because they've had to wait until it's safer to express. Um, and so on top of that, the fact that um, government is refusing to bring in sex and relationships education, that we know from practice that actually people are not getting very much more than kind of penetrative vaginal intercourse education, which is only so informative for anyone, um, even if you have a vagina. Um, and then I think there's something about then going straight from that place into dating apps or into, you know, without having the practice of being able to explore and make mistakes, but to do that in full sight of maybe your family or the community or at school and to be able to be open about that and how damaging that can be really. Um, and it can also be brilliant, but I think there's something about how, do you, how and where do you develop those skills really. And I think what happens is young people do the best they can. So they're kind of reliant on their friends, the internet, finding out through good experiences or meeting kind of queer people that show it sort of introduce them into the world. But there's also the big risks around kind of HIV, other STIs, particularly for young men. And also as across the kind of field with young people around domestic abuse. Um, and I think we're also seeing and this, a reduction in LGBT services, you know, PACE disappearing is a terrible loss to the community the other month. You know, across the Northwest, they've lost 20 of their 35 youth projects and they go very quickly, which is partly the dynamic of our community being treated in a particular way. Um, and also I found reference to, you know, since 2000, there have been in London alone 100 bars and 30 clubs that have closed. And not all of that is just creativity and kind of the need to uh, kind of change and do new things. There's, there's something bigger going on. And I would say one of those bigger things is that we're in the midst of a mental health crisis for all young people in the past generation. So ironically, all these things that we've been, young people have been told forever about, like drink less and smoke less, take less drugs and don't get pregnant, like they're doing all those things. But actually, overall, you know, in the last 25 years, we've seen mental health kind of depression, anxiety rocket. Um, and that's very complicated why that is. Um, but, you know, a lot of those young people are increasingly not getting the care they need. So... The Metro Centre research, which I think is great, I'd recommend you all go and have a look at it. Um, the biggest survey of LGBTQ young people that's ever been done in this country, as far as I'm aware. And what was good about it is the numbers, so over 7,000, but also they recruited six, over 600 straight and um, non-trans respondents so that there could be some ca comparison. So a lot of the messages in this will not be a surprise, so I won't go into them too much really, but kind of discrimination, high levels of abuse, and it's very interesting around sexual abuse, that there are high levels for both sets, 18% versus 11. Um, but actually of the LGBTQ, nearly eight out of 10 hadn't had any support for that kind of trauma. And I think that's very frightening to see that the people are bringing that into their relationships and, and what they do with that. So unsurprisingly, people not feeling so accepted in their community, up to 
nearly one in ten have had to leave home and there will be much greater numbers of people dealing with the prospect of that or the fear of that and how that affects how they are in the world. Um, school remains a hostile and difficult place to be um, and there's a failure and still a reported failure really around challenging um, uh, homophobic, biphobic and transphobic language. Unsurprisingly, there are much higher levels of mental health problems, which I'll go into in a minute, particularly around um, trans young people, but also around anyone <coughs> not identifying on either end of the spectrum around 0 or 6. So, a graph. Uh, depression, anxiety, self-harm and suicidal ideation. Really what I wanted to pick out here was just the gendered nature of it. So actually, I remember when youth groups were being set up and they were saying, oh, LGBT youth groups, and they'd be like, oh, you know, young gay men are the ones who are most in need. And clearly there is need, but actually what we're seeing, and I think it's been echoed across the piece today, is that anyone not identifying as straightforward, you know, there's, there's a gender aspect around young women in general, but particularly if you're questioning or you're bi, identifying in those ways or in some other way, that you have higher levels across the piece. And actually, in the male sense of things, it's actually gay men are doing better, or they're still worse than... Uh, heterosexual um, overall. So that kind of just gives you that sense of how gendered it is. Uh, and I guess one of the things for therapists, kind of a positive thing, two things here really I just want to pull out is how young people are when they know. So actually more trans young people knowing, nearly 58% you know, knowing um, by the age of 13 and 53% of LGBTQ. And I think there's a real gap in the market around what's going on about how we think about under 16 year olds because actually what we're seeing is a, a rolling back generation on generation and I think there's a real fear within our community but also in general about how we talk about that and how we bring those needs to the fore and I think with trans young people it's happening because there's a need around puberty when progressive work happens um, but also the issue around trans young people is that half hadn't told their family and 28% uh, had told nobody compared to 5% for LGBT young people. So there's something about most need and greater isolation and obviously in relation to bisexuality they are more likely to be identifying as bisexual. So there's lots of strategies that young people use to kind of what I kind of call duck and dive and kind of survive um, how difficult the adults and the structures that adults design that they have to deal <coughs> with um, just how complicated and sophisticated they might need to be, particularly as they very often won't have the money, the privacy, a car, a house, or you know, even access to um, services that are culturally appropriate where they're living. And that's probably getting worse. While at the same time we have the positivity around identities proliferating and there being more confidence in that. So I guess I want to kind of give those young people credit for what they're doing. So one term uh, which Lassa and Baringer use is um, visibility management. So something about a little bit like those sort of weather clocks, like you're out, you're in, and it's about when, when it's safe to be like that, and I think everyone can probably relate to that in some way, around how you monitor self-presentation. So actually it's about passing as straight, um, and then there are times when you can relax and be more, more yourself, and that, you know, and certainly that's been true, and in the work I did when I set up Mosaic Youth Project, particularly around kind of um, BME young people, you know, you just have to, it's kind of a dance you have to do within your community and, and for you to get as much as you can out of your queer experience. Um, obviously, you try and avoid as much as possible those people and those places who are going to treat you badly. So that, the, the research showing that's religion and sports, unsurprisingly. But there are certain places you can't avoid um, and those are trickier. And I think definitely, certainly in my work, but also in the research, showing that people will roam the corridors of their school, like to stay away from the place where it's difficult. Um, or, or not be at school at all. And I think there's a lot of patience in the queer community, the young people like waiting. I think some young people just go, I'm going to wait. I'm going to have to wait till I get to work or till I get to college or university um, where it will be easier. And the, although the evidence is mixed on that, it depends. It does tend to get easier, but it really depends what work you're in. Um, and there's still a lot of homophobia, biphobia and transphobia in those institutions. Um, and I would just say people have a kind of healthy drive, I would say, that young people look for the information, for the kind of language for themselves, the activism and the kind of networks that make sense to them. I think the internet's transformed that, obviously, in social media. But I think, in part, that's a reflection of the failure of other kind of traditional structures that should be supporting our children and young people to grow up healthily. Um, and I guess there's something about, at some point, those feelings have to go somewhere. Ideally, they, they come to us in the therapy room and they can be projected and held by us. But I think, given the amount of trauma and shame and externalised prejudice people are having to take down, 
um, it's no wonder that that can come out in terms of drugs and alcohol or sex um, that's risky or ending up not feeling valuable enough and not being treated in a valuable way in relationships. And I guess there's something, and it struck me what someone said earlier about that kind of long-term impact. And I always think never lose sight of the, the child and the young person, what context they've grown up in as a queer person, because they will bring that with them even as an adult. So, uh, I feel like I'm running at full pace through. Um, so these are just a few concluding remarks, and I'm really curious to kind of engage with you around what you think about this, really, because I just know what I know, and I'm bringing that to you. Um, I guess, again, just to say, I think um, LGBT young people are great in terms of they're kind of pushed into a position where they have to be very kind of hyper-vigilant about prejudice very often to anticipate um, and to be very sensitive to it. And they develop very complicated survival strategies often. And that that involves embodied trauma and kind of shame very often. And I guess some of it is very simple. I think what young people are saying they want really is they just want to, want to be accepted. And it's quite Rogerian really. They're like, just, you know, uh, be non-judgmental and supportive focus on the issues that we bring to you. It's not always about like, I'm gay, it's a problem, I'm trans or I'm bi, you know, let's talk about it. It might be that my mum's a nightmare or like dad's violent. It, you know, the presumption sometimes is, can be that it will all be about that difference and it isn't. Um, and I think there's something in our work as therapists around how are we in the world all the time? So something about kind of day in, in our daily lives around how we challenge prejudice where we find it, whether that's in our family, um, in community, um, or in the organisations we work in. And I guess there's something about we all bring our own kind of values and beliefs into the therapy space and into our lives, um, and that we all kind of need ongoing personal development to recognise and act on kind of where we all have our blind spots, particularly around sexuality and gender identity. Um, yeah, and I guess there's just something about that kind of under 16 thing around. I think it's a real issue um, across the LGBT um, QI, including intersex, around how we work with the issues as they emerge. Um, and I actually have. I've got time. Have I got time? Uh, okay, so I'm going to do this thing first, which is to point at Chris and say, this is with the training that we'll be doing. And if you're curious about it, then come and talk to either of us at some point. And then I want to bring a child's voice in. <laughs> Hope she becomes prime minister, basically. Some girls like superheroes, some girls like princesses. Some boy like superheroes, some girl some boy like princesses. Absolutely. Why absolutely right. does all the girls have like pink stuff and all the boys have like different color stuff? It's a good question, Riley. <laughs> <laughs> What I like about that is then she's off on to the next issue. Yeah. <laughs> Dealt with that now, next issue. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, I think, enough from me, really.